and her ancestral past, I would pair bond with one of the few females that was my general age bracket in my small group. And then we would have kids together or whatever. And then maybe we'd drift apart after a few years and maybe not, maybe we'd spend our life together. But, but if a new woman came along, well, there was this real value in my trying to, and, and for my partner as well, if a new guy came along, there's real value in diversity because then you don't put all your genetic eggs in one basket. And so we evolved to be attracted to new individuals and to find them exciting and interesting, even though they're not. And so, because quickly they become not a new individual. But the problem is that in today's world, there's variety everywhere. Like you, you open the door and there's countless number of, of your preferred sex who are your right age bracket and stuff like that. So if you're you or me, that's okay. It makes it a little bit harder to stay partnered up. But if you're famous and, and those people are throwing themselves at you all the time, it's almost impossible to stay partnered up, right? And so when you look at, at, at people who are famous, movie stars or rock stars or whatever, almost none of them, there's like 99% of them are unfaithful to their partners. And what that tells you is that there's a 99% chance that you and I would be unfaithful to our partners if we were in that situation and the people throwing themselves at us all day because there's so much variety. So we evolved to take advantage of that when it came along because it hardly ever came along. Now it comes along every day. And those people who can't avoid it or ignore it and, and, and form long-term pair bonds where they're the ones who suffer. So welcome to Real Talks podcast, Bill. Thank you for coming on, man. Totally my pleasure. I thought that we should start with why did you decide to focus on studying evolution? So I'm a social psychologist, which means that I'm interested in how people are today and, and really their everyday lives, what makes them persuade each other, what makes them happy, uh, why do relationships last and, or fail. And I've been doing that for 30 years now. And, and after about the first 15 or 20 years, I started to be a little bit dissatisfied with the approach that we typically adopt, which is basically we say, oh, people do X because it makes them happy or it gives them a sense of control or it raises their self-esteem. But we never ask the question, well, why does X make you happy or raise your self-esteem, right? Why that? Why doesn't it do the opposite? And so I started to get very interested in, well, let's look back in time and see where we came from and what caused our ancestors to be successful or less successful. And let's see if we can sew that together with what we know about humans today. And of course, I'm not the only one doing this. Lots of us work on this problem. And I just started to get really excited about that approach to how we could go about it. That's great. So where does our story begin? So look, there's lots of places that you could begin the story of understanding humans. For example, if you're interested in mother-infant bonding, you would want to go back to the beginning of the evolution of mammals because mammals aren't going to be successful unless they get mother-infant bonding. So there's lots of traits that we have that have different ages. Some of them we share with celery, so it goes way back. Some of them we share uh, with all other mammals, and some of them we only share with other primates, and some of them are unique to us. And I was particularly interested in what's unique to us. And so for, for what that meant to me was really our story begins six or seven million years ago. It's That's when we split apart from our chimpanzee cousins. And so everything that happened since then is why we're different from them and therefore of particular interest to me. So I heard you say that the reason why we split from our chimpanzee cousins was because of some sort of deforestation and we were forced to be out in the open, which was something that didn't happen before. That's right. So if you look at the Great African Rift Valley, it, it runs um, up from the north by the Red Sea, and it runs down. Um, and if you extend that tectonic line, it actually runs all the way down to uh, the coast of Mozambique. And it's kind of like a, a geographic zipper where Africa is being torn slowly into two pieces, a larger piece moving up to the left, smaller piece moving lower to the right. And that's been going on for about 30 million years. And what's happened as that progresses is that the land on the east side of the rift is upwelling or rising up to altitude and drying out. And so what you've got is there used to be rainforest on both sides. And now everything on the east side of the rift is slowly drying out and turning into open woodlands and savanna. By about six million years ago, there was very little extensive rain, very little contiguous rainforest left. And so now you're in a situation where if you're a primate, if you're a chimpanzee-like ancestor of ours, and you're on the wrong side of the Rift Valley, you're stuffed, right? You've got to come out of the trees. 
And so that seems to be, we don't know, of course, but the data line up very well with that looks like that's the start of our story. And I would imagine it's a lot harder for us to survive out in the open than in the forest climbing the trees. That's right. So if you're a ch if you look at chimpanzees today and you say, well, let's assume that's what our chimp-like ancestors look like. We can't know with certainty, but but probably pretty similar to that. They're kings of the canopy. You know, they're so fast and so dangerous and so acrobatic when they're up in the tree in the canopy that even leopards, who are very good tree climbers and who are dangerous to them on the ground, won't try to attack them in trees when they're in their groups. And so all those factors combined mean that. They go from this world where they're basically at the top of the food chain to a world where they're basically on the bottom. Hyenas, lions, leopards, even saber-toothed cats, which roamed the, play, the Pleistocene um, East African environment, would have been eating them whenever they felt like it because they're just too slow and too small to defend themselves on the ground. Yeah, those saber-toothed cats are like some huge teeth creatures, right? <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly right. And, you know, there aren't any left, but they're in all the museums. And you can look at that thing and go, yeah, I would not want to encounter that. <laughs> so how did we survive out in the open? What do you think we did? We did? Well, of course, we're only estimating and inferring. But one thing we do know is that if you look at in Senegal, there is a population of chimpanzees who do live on the savanna. I, I don't know why they choose to do that, but they do. And we can look at the behaviors of this chimp population in Senegal and see what they do and assume that that's probably what we did first, right? Because it's working for them. And what they do is they tend to skulk around the edges. They stay near trees. And so if a predator comes zing up the tree, they go. They tend to sleep in caves, you know, cavemen. That's kind of, it, it makes good sense. They also do a couple of things that are unique to chimps. They use their teeth to sharpen branches and then turn them into spears. And they spear these small monkeys that they hunt. Um, by to get them out of the hull of a tree and, and kill them and eat them. And they uh, share better than, than forest chimps do. They're more inclined to share with their mates. And they travel in larger groups, which is kind of what gives them more eyes to look around and you know be wary of predators. All of those behaviors are probably the kinds of things that led toward becoming a little bit more like us and allowed them to be successful, at least in the beginning. Now, I don't, they were nothing successful like we are, right? They're, it's one small isolated group and they're not taking over the savanna, but they're surviving on it. And that suggests that that's probably the kind of thing that our ancestors did as well. I want to emphasize what you said, sharing, and they started cooperating. When did we start to see that with our ancestors? So again, we can't be certain. There's really good evidence that by Homo erectus, we're doing that. So once we get to Homo erectus, who probably arrived on the planet about 2 million years ago, that's the best data that we have so far. We have they're in South Africa by 2 million years ago. So around then, we now we start to see that species is capable of doing all sorts of cooperative behaviors. They're hunting animals way larger than themselves, which obviously would have taken cooperation. Um, they're working together to create their stone tools, which are quite complex. We don't have those data from 2 million years ago, but we do have those data from that species by 1.2 million years ago. And uh, they're engaging in a variety of other behaviors that that strongly indicate a lot of cooperation in a way that a chimpanzee just couldn't. I personally think that in all probability that that pushes back another million to a million and a half years before that to Australopithecus. And there's a host of reasons that Australopithecus would have been motivated to cooperate in a way that chimpanzees aren't and would have benefited by cooperating in a way that chimpanzees don't. It's just that we don't have the data. There's so few of the skeletal remains that we don't know. But I suspect that that's probably when it started. And what does it imply? What does it imply? Why is this important? This start of the cooperation to then later stages of our evolutionary process. So, the, if you if you look at the evolution of our cranial capacity, just the size of our brain, and you you take a chimpanzee as the probable starting point seven million years ago, the current size of their brain, it probably is the same as it was then. And then you look at what happened over time. You see that for a long time in the savanna, there was very little change. So by the time we get to Australopithecus afarensis, we now have an animal that's bipedal. It's a little bit taller than a chimpanzee. Bipedal, it means it walks upright. And instead of a, a chimp brain of about 380 grams, now you've got an Australopithecus brain of about 450 grams. So three to three and a half million years has gained you 70 grams of brain power, which is bad, but it's not very much. Then when you go from Australopithecus to Homo erectus, now you go from 450 to 960 in just a little over a million years. And then you go from 960 to 1350, which is us, 
in the next million and a half to two million years. And so that's like adding an entire chimp brain on top of Homo erectus. So why was there this slow, slow, and then sudden takeoff? And many people believe, we don't know, but the data are consistent with this idea that what happened is once we started to cooperate, once we started to work together as groups, now that there were there were reasons to to be smarter in the sense that if we were smarter, we could gain more things from our environment and thereby pay the rent on that big brain. And so if you think to yourself, well, you know, why aren't zebras smarter? Why aren't um, mosquitoes smarter? It would be, it would behoove them to be smarter. They could escape predators better and they could get out of your screen when they're stuck in your house and don't want to be anymore or whatever, right? Well, it, it don't, they can only get smarter if they can then pay the rent on a bigger brain. They have to bring in more higher quality calories. And neither of those animals can do that. I mean, look at a, a zebra. It's got hooves, no hands, so it can't make any tools. It's all it can do is eat grass. And so even if it's an Einstein zebra that could discuss amazing things, it can't pay the rent on that huge metabolically expensive brain. But once we start to cooperate, now we our groups could gain properties that individuals don't have. So what if they could have plan and have division of labor? Well, now suddenly they're going to be much more effective. A group is no longer three individuals. It's got emergent properties. So I can say to you, all right, you go over there and I'll go here and I'll scare the mammoth. And then you pull the vine and it'll trip over the cliff and we'll all eat like kings. You know, you bring in a lot of calories when you have the capacity to plan and division of labor, whereas a zebra can't do that under any circumstance. And so for the first time in our line, once I believe it was with Australopithecus, but exactly where it happened, we don't know. Once they started to cooperate, now, if their brain grew larger, they could benefit a lot from it, gain new capacities that can allow our brain to grow even larger still. And so by Homo erectus, now we're, they're controlling fire. We know it goes back at least a million years. And once you can cook your food, you can extract even more calories from it. So those kinds of things kept allowing us to just get smarter and smarter. And I believe accounts for this you know, steep gradient whereby we gained very little brain power until we started working together and then it really took off. So the core of our evolution, what you're saying is started with cooperation. I believe so. I mean, you know, look, a chimpanzee is a pretty clever animal. And an Australopithecus was even more clever. They've got a good 70 grams of brain on top of that. But they're nothing like us. And so turning from them into us was a process that happened when chimpanzees, they don't cooperate very well together. They will under the right circumstances, but by and large, they're very competitive with each other. And by and large, when they're off doing things, they'd rather hunt and do things like that alone if they could do it successfully. Human beings are the opposite. We want to be together. We want to hunt with each other. And it's that cooperative nature, that gregariousness that gave us those advantages of getting smarter and that started giving our groups emergent properties. And also, that kind of cooperation was the first time in our line where your group's goals and your individual goals go together. Chimpanzees can't achieve that much because they're constantly at loggerheads with each other. We can achieve an enormous amount because we want to work together. We want to cooperate to go off and achieve our goals together. So that was the beginning of becoming human. And then when did we start to see communication and more advanced uh, cooperation tools? Look, that's a great question. We don't know. Um, my guess is that the, the pressure to communicate with language, the kind of complex communication we have, you know, some monkeys can go, Predator in the sky, predator on the ground. They have different calls for that. That's pretty slick, but it's not like what we can do, right? They're not having conversations. They have no grammar and they can't communicate an infinite number of complex ideas. They have a very set number of ideas they can communicate. And so that capacity to communicate complicated ideas would be worthless in an animal that doesn't have complicated ideas to communicate. And so by the time we get to Homo erectus, now we have an animal, a, a, be, a being who can plan for unfelt needs, who can envision a world in the future that's different than the way it is today, and who has division of labor. So planning and division of labor suddenly allows you to conceive of a world that's tomorrow or conceive of a world that's a long way away. Now, I can sign a lot of things to you. I can sign to you that I'm hungry. I can sign to you that I want to fight with you, but I can't sign to you, hey, tomorrow, let's do, you know, that's not possible, right? And so suddenly there's, I can conceive of tomorrow, and so there's pressure on me to try to be able to communicate tomorrow. And so I, my, my belief is that with Homo erectus, they started to develop a very complex gestural language, which is probably the reason we still use our hands so much when we talk today. And then following on that, there was change to be control of our voice box and all the kinds of evolutionary adaptations that allow us to actually speak and listen. 
Because we're the only species that can talk about tomorrow, right? That can plan for the future. Yeah. We're the, to, to the best of our knowledge, we're the only species that can plan for a future with unfelt needs. And so other spe- even other smart animals, to the best of our knowledge, they can't envision mutually contradictory futures. So, for example, my favorite experiment that's about showing this is done by my colleague here at U- my colleagues here at UQ, John Redshaw and Thomas Sudendorf. And what they did is super clever. They have this Y-shaped tube where it comes down one line then splits into two. And so there's a little tube at the top and then it splits to two tubes at the bottom and they drop a grape down it. Now, if you're sitting there and you wanna catch the grape because you like grapes, and if you're a chimp, you do, well, you wanna put your hand under the tube that you think it's gonna come out. And amazingly, chimps choose one side or the other, but they don't put their hand under both sides because they can envision that it might come out the right and that it might come out the left, but they can't envision, well, those two are mutually exclusive, but it could be one or the other. They can't do that. Now that's dead simple for us. Little tiny kids can't do it either though. So if you put a two-year-old in that device, they'll just put one hand out at a time. But by the time they get to three or four, they go, oh, I want that grape. I'm putting out both hands and then I'm guaranteed to get it. And amazingly, when chimps or two-year-olds put both hands out, you go, oh, the penny dropped, they figured it out but then they go right back to one or the other because all they're really doing is kind of guessing where it's gonna come. They can't say, gee, the future could go right and it could go left, I better be prepared for both. And that's such a simple activity for a human, but that does not appear to have come into our line until Homo erectus, that capacity to plan for the future. And maybe whales and dolphins can do that, you know, there's animals that are hard to test, but all the other things they can't do suggest they probably can't do that either. And what are the most interesting implications that you found from studying evolution? Well, for me, what's fascinating is just learning where we came from, right? That's, that's cool. But secondarily, you want to use that to predict where we're, why we are the way we are and develop new hypotheses to help understand ourselves better. And once you sort of get a picture of the past, you start to say, all right, well, what, what implications is that for the present? And, and let me just give you one, for example, there's, there's many, of course. But, but one example is if we evolved to cooperate with each other, and that was our big tool, that's what made us a success, then it suggests that maybe our minds are oriented toward the social world more than might benef- be beneficial to us in a kind of more modern existence. So if you take a step back and think, well, what's the defining feature of humanity? I would say the defining feature of us is our technological success, our inventiveness. You know, here you and I are many thousands of miles apart having a conversation. We're both in climate controlled worlds. We eat when we feel like it. We, we just live these awesome, comfortable lives. And our chimp ancestors that we departed from 7 million years ago are sitting on the same tree branches in the same hot sun and the same cold rain. We're exactly where we left them. And what's differentiated us from them more than anything else is our inventiveness. And yet, if I had to bet, I bet you've never invented anything in your life. I know I haven't. And so, How could it be that our species is this incredibly inventive species? It's our defining feature, really. And yet, most people never invent anything. And I think the answer to that question is that it turns out, I believe, that what this history shows us is that we, our minds are focused on social functioning. They're not focused on products, on technology, on devices. And so, if you or I have a need, we think, well, how can I solve that need by getting help from my friends? And so, when I was a kid back in the 1970s, and I'm going to, traveling around and going to uni in the 80s, early 80s, uh, going to university, I, I flew thousands of miles with this heavy suitcase that had no wheels on it, because that's what all suitcases were like in those days. And it never once occurred to me, why don't I just put wheels on my stupid suitcase? Instead, I thought, I wonder if I can get my brother to go to the airport with me and help me shut my bags. Or I wonder if I have enough money to pay for a porter who literally is going to put my unwheeled suitcase on a wheeled platform and then take it the last 100 meters, right? And so, Wheels on suitcases are not rocket science, but they weren't really invented until the 1980s because that one, they didn't work properly until then. It's, it's so easy. And, and the reason I think that is that we just default to how can I have my help, friends help me solve my problems. But that doesn't mean that we're not capable of inventing. What that means is that we aim our inventive minds at social solutions to problems, not at technological ones. And so I think what these data show us is that All human beings are in fact inventive. All of us are capable of inventing complicated things. Now, you and I couldn't invent all the stuff between the two of us because that took thousands of people to invent all the bits and bobs. But, but we could be inventive if we had to. It's just that we tend not to because we solve our problems socially. 
And that in turn suggests that maybe the folks who are actually doing all the inventing in the world are the less social folks, the folks who are less likely to turn to their friends to help them solve problems. And sure enough, if you look at the data, engineers and scientists and folks who invent stuff tend to be a lot less social than folks like you and me who probably never invented anything in our lives. <laughs> wow. So we default to like being social, asking for help. And then you would say that more introverted people are the ones that are actually doing the inventions. Well, it may be introversion, but introverts are often very social too. They just want a smaller circle of closer friends. I think what it's more is the sort of people on the autism spectrum, people who are a little bit aspy. You know, they could be super clever, but they're just not as keen on other people. And so if I'm going out of town, I call you, hey, Antonio, man, I'm going out of town. Could you come feed the cat? And I want to do that because you and I are mates and you like my cat. And I know that when you fly out of town, you know, I'll come feed your dog. So, you know, that's just, it's just fun for both of us. We like to be social. We like to solve our problems that way. But if I'm a little bit on the spectrum, I don't know who I should call. And I'm not sure how big of an imposition it is to ask you to feed my cat because I don't understand other humans as well. But I think, well, you know, I, I've got a lawnmower and I've got an aquarium and I can attach that to my toaster and make a device that throws cat food on the floor at set intervals and boom, I'm set, right? So I can invent something new. And, and I think that's what the history of invention shows us. It's the people who are a little bit more aspy, if you will, or a little bit less social, who are more inclined to think about world and technological terms and use the exact same capable capabilities that we have, but they focus them in a different way. Rather than trying to solve the problem socially, they, they're more likely to solve them technically. And it's also interesting to see like the evolution of communication, how we started with, you know, stories, the fire, and then we transitioned to the written word. And now we have the internet and we're doing what we're doing now. And I see a strong correlation between communication and innovation. So collaborating in team has really helped us become what we are now. And you touch a very important point, which is community, commute, commute, like the knowledge that has been acquired throughout history is what we have now. So we don't have to start from the beginning. Yeah, that's what we call cumulative culture. And so you have this notion that in contrast to every other animal, right? Every other animal, the day it's born, it can't have grandpa sit around and tell a great stories and tell it how to live its life. It's got to learn all over again. And so every other animal on this planet, no matter how long they live, they ratchet up the knowledge and then boom, they drop to basically ground zero and the next generation starts over. But if you look at human culture, it's cumulative, it ratchets itself up. And the way that it does that is exactly as you said, by these amazing communicative abilities that we have, allow grandpa to tell us stories about how, what you, life used to be like and how we solve problems. And, allow, and now that we're all connected together, you know, the greatest scientists on earth, they solve a problem and immediately it's written down somewhere. It, it gets reported in all the media and the internet and what nobody on the planet knew 10 years ago, now a school kid knows today, right? It's this extraordinary world we live in and oral st storytelling made it local. The written form, which is about 5,000 years ago, made it start to spread. And now the internet has democratized it in a way that never existed before, such that knowledge can spread at basically the speed of light. And now human beings everywhere benefit from the ideas that others have, and they can work together in better ways as well, right? You know, human minds are amazing, but what really makes them amazing is when they connect to each other. And the internet, of course, allows all that. So it's, you just see this massive acceleration of knowledge as we get more and more connected to each other. And do you know how much knowledge we have lost? Because like, we don't know how to build the pyramids or we don't know how the colossal heads appeared there. So do you know yeah. to what extent how much knowledge we have lost along the way? Yeah, it's a guarantee we've lost lots of really great stuff. And, and really, in some ways, the biggest loss is not even the big heads that appear in, on Easter Island or whatever. And people wonder how they got there or, or flogging the slaves and make them build the pyramids. And how do they do that? But, but in a way, the worst story is think of all those amazing talents who, had they had the good luck to live when you and I do, could have won the Nobel Prize in physics, chemistry, poetry, whatever. But instead, they're sitting in a hut somewhere and they're a hunter-gatherer like because everyone's a hunter-gatherer. And they're in their mind, there's this really rich world and they're wondering about the stars or any of those things, but they have no opportunity to learn the kinds of things you need to know. There's no written language. They can't connect to the world. And that must have happened countless millions of times where incredible geniuses came and went 
and the world didn't benefit one bit from them. Maybe their family was like, wow, Bob was a really lovely guy and, and he had the best ways of hunting you know, zebras I ever saw but they didn't change the world the way they could have because the world wasn't interconnected then. And now they have, every human has the capacity with, with a few very unlucky exceptions, basically every human has the capacity to connect to the world, find out how it works and contribute if they have something to add to it. And since we're talking about connection and contributing, I feel like one of the most pivotal things that we have in life is obviously the most intimate connection, our partner, the that we share our life with how has that played a role in evolution i know why is sexual selection so important so um humans are pair bonding species and the reason that we're pair bonding in other words we, we we like to form these monogamous relationships to humans and the reason we like to do that is that human infants are so weak and helpless and so needing of care for so long and so if you look at species where like a wildebeest if you ever watched the nature show, the wildebeest gets birthed, it drops in the grass, the mum eats the uh, placenta material, well, you know, that's their thing. And, and then 20 seconds later, it's kind of getting up and then 30 seconds later, it's running off, right? I mean, it can eat grass and it can run. It, mostly what it does is it drinks milk for a while. So it, it ha it's a mammal, it depends on its mother in that way. It's basically ready to go. Even if its dad was a loving dad wildebeest, and wanted to offer it wildebeest advice, it's got nothing it can do for it. The mum produces milk, the thing can eat grass pretty soon, and, and its job is drink milk, then eat grass, run away from predators. You know, it doesn't need anything else. And so what does a wildebeest gain by pair bonding and trying to produce subsequent wildebeest? In contrast, because that's a lot of effort and energy. In contrast, when you look at birds, or if you look at species primates where there's a lot of energy producing the baby. Depending on the system, you often, but not always, get pair bonding. Birds are a great example because they're these little things that are helpless in a nest, they can't fly yet. So you got to bring in worms or seeds all day, right? Um, humans are the same. You got to bring them stuff all day. And so in order to help them survive, they can get by with just the mom, especially if the mom's family's in the game helping, and, and that's super common. But they tend to do better if dad cares and dad's trying to get them uh, additional calories and protection and stuff like that as well. And so what that means is that we evolved to pair bond with each other because we're much more effective reproducing that way. And that created this, it, it, it was pretty easy as mammals. We're already capable of loving our children, if we're female anyway. And all we had to do was turn that same and loving our mother, whether we're male or female, bonding to her. And so we just need to use that same mechanism that's already in place and aim it laterally at each other and have it not just be sex, but also be bonding. And lots and lots of man mammals have achieved that. Humans have too. And, and it's nice as a human, like you fall in love and you feel great. And then the one thing we know is that if you find a good partner, you're, you're compatible with each other, that that's one of the few things in life where your happiness actually goes up and stays up. Everything else in life, you get a little happier and then you go right back down to where you were. But a good, a good long-term relationship can keep you happier for the rest of your life. And so we've evolved to do that. And evolution rewards us when we achieve that goal by making us happier. Hmm. So what, what other implications have you found that affect happiness? Like our innate evolutionary processes, what implications from that do you know that if you do this, it will make you happier or it will raise your base happiness level or whatever? Well, good relationships is one of the most important ones, but there's other ones that are sometimes a little bit less obvious. Um, so one of the ones that I like to think about and talk about is if you, a lot of us think about work as just something that you got to do, right? You got to bring home a paycheck. And so you've got to go off and do it. But we actually evolved to have a very strong desire to contribute more to our group than we cost. So we want that our, we want the benefits of being with us to be greater than the cost of being with us because our ancestors who were more cost than benefit got whacked in the back of the head or they got left behind. And so we all have this strong motive to contribute. And work is one of the ways that allows you to do that. And especially if you can work where you cooperate with other humans in order to generate some kind of a outcome. It could be a service, it could be a product, it could be lots of things. But if, if your job allows you to work together with other people, hopefully that you like, and then achieve what it is that you set out to achieve. That just gives us a fundamental sense of satisfaction because it, it's allowing us to, to provide more than we cost. And one of the things about getting older, of course, is that that process shifts over time. And so 
if you, you know, when you retire, a lot of people suddenly have this incredible feeling of disconnection. And part of the problem is they have to discover a new way to continue to contribute because even retired people in the past, if you were old and you couldn't contribute, you know, you often got pushed out on that ice flow. And so you don't want that to happen to you. And so you want to find a way. And, and one of the ways it's super common when you're older is you say, well, I can help out with my grandkids. I can pass on the knowledge that I've gained. I can establish some kind of legacy. We, we start to look out and we want to mentor younger people. There's things like that that we've literally evolved to want to do. And because we've evolved to want to do them, they're very satisfying when you do. And so I always encourage people to it doesn't have to be at the workplace for money. That's not what's important. It could be volunteering your time. It could be lots of things. But particularly if you can find a way to cooperate with others and, and make the world a bit better place, that's very satisfying. I, I could see how that ties to us wanting to help other people because before, if you didn't help, as you said, you either get left by the group or or they just wouldn't pay attention to you and you wouldn't feel loved or whatever. So how do you think like capitalist society and individualism is affecting happiness in that way? Yeah, so look, there's a fundamental tension in all human beings between a desire to be related and connected to others. By related, I don't mean by blood. I just mean a feeling of relationship and connection with others. And that's super important ever since we were out in the savannah and had to learn to cooperate in order to survive. We have that strong bond, desire to connect with others. But at the same time, the more connected I am to other people, the more I have to subvert my own goals in order to get along and in order to do what the group wants to do. And so in, in direct contradiction to my desire to connect is a desire for autonomy and to do what I particularly want to do, what I as an individual would most want to do. And every society up until the advent of cities on this planet leaned very hard on connection because you were so close to the margin of survival, the connection was way more important than autonomy. It just, you couldn't afford to be an autonomous individual. But I'm sure that they had desires for autonomy too. And they were frustrated when their lives demanded that they focus only on connection and, and could never just do what they wanted to, or at least not very often. And so that tension exists in all of us. And the modern world is really nice because it allows us to express that autonomy need That, that our ancestors just had to sort of press down and ignore probably most of their whole lives because now I can survive easily. And so if I like to, you know, go uh, rock climbing and my wife, my wife likes to play tennis, we can just go in different directions. It's not a big deal. We'll meet at the end of the day. Whereas ancestrally, that kind of thing wasn't so easy to do. Now, of course, nothing, no big change like that comes without costs. And if you lean too hard on autonomy, you start to lose a sense of relatedness. And lots of um, behavioral scientists, lots of scholars have argued that human beings are losing their connections to each other and they're losing their happiness as a consequence. There's wonderful books like Bowling Alone and other kinds of treatises on this very problem, that modern people in, in industrialized societies, often, especially if they're in big cities, often don't even know their neighbors. They don't even know their name. They don't have that sense of connection anymore. And, and there's a real psychological cost to that. So that balance is not easy. And different societies may put that balance line in different places. But all, for every society, there's a tension in every individual between having a good sense of relatedness and simultaneously maintaining a sense of autonomy. And how do you think social media plays a part there? Because it's like a connection, but it's not a real connection, you know? Yeah, social media is a super interesting case because we evolved in order to form these personal connections and our biology actually comes in synchrony with each other when we do it in real life. And so if you and I are having this conversation, we're sitting at a coffee shop in Madrid or whatever city you're in right now, and and we and we're we're sipping cappuccinos or whatever and, and having this conversation we would literally start to move in synchrony with each other. Our pupils would start to dilate in synchrony with each other. Probably the data are new, but probably even our brains would start to synchronize with each other. What we don't know is how well does that work when we're thousands of miles apart. And so these connections that we have are so good. There's barely a lag. We can hear each other easily. We can see each other easily. We didn't evolve in a world where there's two-dimensional humans that we ever encountered. And we didn't evolve in a world where We, we evolved in a world where if you look like you're smaller, it's because you're farther away. And so your head is only that big to me, right? 
but it, it doesn't make, I don't think, oh, what's this tiny human, a flat, tiny flat human I'm talking to, right? You just look like a, my mind solves the problem instantly and without effort. And so I suspect that at some level, we're automatically acting as if we're really in front of each other. But in other levels, we may not be. And, and we don't know enough about that yet. We don't have good data on what kind of synchrony we can create online, how disrupted it is, how important it is to have a really good, fast internet connection to allow it, et cetera. We just don't know. Hmm. So we don't even know if that synchrony that you talked about is going on right now. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure people are working on it. I haven't seen any good data that answered that look at the physiology of that. Um, my guess is that it's no surprise that the more distant we are and the more laggy it is, the less that that'll work. But amazingly, some of my colleagues did work with children and with chimpanzees, and, and even videotaping is not quite the same as being in front of a mirror. And so it, it seems like it would be the same, especially if there's no lag, but it's not. So there's lots of things that could get in the way there, and we just don't know much about them yet. Hmm. Well, that brings me to question, like, what other things aside from language and body gestures are we picking in, you know? Yeah, and, and my guess is that part of it is how close we tend to sit to each other, how much our body grenade to each other, probably things like sense. I mean, you can only see me from right there upward, and we're used to encoding all that and using that information, and, and this is just this little narrow piece, right? And that's got to matter. How much it matters, I don't know. And when we're only looking at a picture and we're getting like the likes, for example, in Instagram and comments, and we're texting, is that real connection? Is that like similar to actually speaking to someone and having a community? Or is that why, why we're seeing, why we're starting to see some problems with depression and anxiety arise from these platforms? Well, the, the data suggests that it, that's way better than nothing. So, you know, you, you Bill all by himself in a pandemic cave versus Bill on Twitter and Facebook and Instagram and, and Zoom and all that, way better to get on these electronic things than not. But the data also suggests that if you use those to replace the in-face in or in-person face-to-face social interaction that you would have had, that that's where it becomes a bad thing. And it's a bad thing for a host of reasons. You know, look at Facebook or Instagram, for example. They're heavily curated, right? Nobody goes, oh, here's what I look like right now. I'm not even going to snap. I won't even look at the picture. I'll just put it up. The world can see me right now. You just don't do that. And so when you get on my Facebook page and see what's Bill up to, you see Bill at his absolute best, I probably took 50 pictures before I found one I liked. Um, I've got my Mai Tai sitting there with the umbrella in it just right. I've got all this great stuff, right? And you go, damn, Bill's life is better than mine. He does, he's does. he got a better Mai Tai. He's got a better – his photo is better. Everything's better, and you feel bad because you know how you are every day, and you're only seeing me how I choose to depict myself. It's just in the same way that movie stars are never as good looking in real life as they are on the screen. Bill's life is not as good as it looks on his Facebook page or his Instagram page, right? Bill's telling a lie. He's self he's self-presenting in a way that he wants to be, that he wants the world to see him that way. And that causes all sorts of unfortunate social comparison processes that also can lead people to become dissatisfied with their own existence. So, and this comparison, from what I've heard you say, comes from us competing for mates, like this sexual selection. Yeah. Yeah, so the, the unfortunate thing is we've got lots of great evolutionary traits that, that make us happy and that do good things for us. But one of the most unfortunate ones is that in order to get a mate, all you really have to do is be the best available in your group. So if my group is a bunch of losers, well, I'm in, I'm in luck, right? Because then the girl's going to pick me because I'm, I'm a little better than they are. But if my group is really wonderful, well, I'm out of luck. She's not going to pick me. And so it doesn't actually matter how good I am be it great or be it not so great, all that matters is how I stack up next to everybody else. And what that means is that status seeking, trying to be a little better than those around you, is literally as what we call a zero-sum game. There's no way that it can be win-win. The only way that I can get the girl when you and I are there together is if I'm a little bit better than you. So for me to get better, you have to get worse. There's lots of great things in the world that are positive somewhere. You and I work together and we hunt, bring down an animal that neither of us could ever get on our own. And it's way better than just, you know, instead of one rabbit each, we bring down a stag, we bring down a big deer. And now we get to eat like kings. 
But social comparison and the status-seeking process is an exception to that rule, and, a, and it's all driven by sexual selection, by the fact that if the girl's going to pick me if I can rise to the top of my group, and otherwise she might pick you, and so somehow I have to get myself above you, and all sorts of unfortunate things come out of that. And it's one of the biggest disruptions of human happiness. You know, we all want to be high status. And look, in our ancestral groups, it would have been okay. You were a better hunter than I am, but I make the arrows better than you do. Or I tell a better story around the fire. I got, some, I got a shot at being better than you at something. I, can, I even have a shot at being the best in our whole group at something. But now in today's world, there's no chance I'm the best at anything. I'm going to be adequate at, is, is all I can really hope for. And that just makes people feel bad. No, and before the comparison was with maybe 30 or 50 people in your group yeah. and now we're comparing ourselves with i don't know the two billion people that use the internet and are yeah. on social media yeah yeah and so there's so many people out there that there's no way i can be best at anything unless it's the most trivial thing that i invented i create a new game now i'm the best in the world but if i do anything that other humans do there's just too many of us and even if momentarily i'm somehow brad pitter Or, or, you know, the world cath lead or whatever, I, I still, that's just a brief moment in time and then the world's going to pass me again. It's just not possible. And so, yeah, it's great to be LeBron James, but 99.9999999% of the planet are not. And so they don't get to be the best at anything. So that's like one perfect example of where we should try to change our default settings. What, what other examples have you found that we need to do this? Well, so I would say in some ways that's the most important, right? That, that we need to not, we need to try to find a way to set aside the social comparison and trying to be the best. And, and the people who succeeded that are looking inward and saying, well, how, how well did I do compared to how well I could do? And sort of setting themselves as their own competition standard. And I think that works really well. But there are a lot of disconnects between the way we live our lives now and the ways that we used to live them in the past. And so one of the most notable ones, if you look at the health of the world, is that In our ancestral past, it was a constant competition to be well-fed. And because sources of salt, sugar, and fat were rare on the savanna, we were searching it out all the time. And when we got our hands on it, we just shoved it down our pile as much as we could. And that was the best thing we could do because that helped us survive until we found it again. Nobody was obese in the past. But now my pantry is full of salt, sugar, and fat. And if I follow my urge, which made me happy, I evolved to seek that stuff out. If I follow that urge and eat as much of it as I can all the time, I'll end up very unhealthy. And so it's very hard to control this. It's the data suggested that obesity is something like 70% genetic, which really tells you it's not obesity itself that's genetic. It tells you that there's something about our modern environments that leads people to be obese. And 70% of that is in their genes, that way the genes interact with the modern environment. Because even when I was a kid, almost nobody was obese. It's a modern problem. And so there's lots of ways like that where we literally have to fight against the way we evolved. Um, variety is another example that goes along with there being so many humans. In our ancestral past, I would pair bond with one of the few females that was my general age bracket in my small group. And then we would have kids together or whatever. And then maybe we'd drift apart after a few years. And maybe not. Maybe we'd spend our life together. But... But if a new woman came along, well, there was this real value in my trying to, and, and for my partner as well, if a new guy came along, there's real value in diversity because then you don't put all your genetic eggs in one basket. And so we evolved to be attracted to new individuals and to find them exciting and interesting, even though they're not. And so, because quickly they become not a new individual. But the problem is that in today's world, there's variety everywhere. Like you, you open the door and there's countless number of, of your preferred sex who are your right age bracket and stuff like that. So if you're you or me, that's okay. It makes it a little bit harder to stay partnered up. But if you're famous and, and those people are throwing themselves at you all the time, it's almost impossible to stay partnered up, right? And so when you look at, at, at people who are famous, movie stars or rock stars or whatever, almost none of them, there's like 99% of them are unfaithful to their partners. And what that tells you is that there's a 99% chance that you and I would be unfaithful to our partners if we were in that situation and the people throwing themselves at us all day because there's so much variety. So we evolved to take advantage of that when it came along because it hardly ever came along. Now it comes along every day. And those people who can't avoid it or ignore it and, and, and form long-term pair bonds, they're the ones who suffer. 
So how have you personally changed your life as a result of knowing all these default settings and which ones we should be changing? Well, it allows you to do, to tell yourself an important truth as you interact with the world. And you, so you look at a Facebook page and their life looks better than yours. And you say, you know, hold on. If I took my best 20 pictures, my life is actually just as good as theirs. There's no need for me to be envious about this. It allows you to not be fussed if you don't get a dozen likes on your picture because it, it doesn't really matter. It allows you to say, well, all right, boy, that, that, that woman I just met at the restaurant really is enticing, but I've got something to go home to that I'm really happy with. And I have to remember that I've evolved to be attracted to that, but, I, but you know that in a couple of years, then that becomes the old thing, even if you do make this big switch and disrupt your life, and then you'll be doing it again. And you don't want to be on this endless treadmill of doing that over and over again. And so it's super helpful to know this and go tell yourself this and avoid those kind of temptations. Temptations aren't easy to resist, but they're very easy to avoid. And so similarly, I know that I'm attracted, like if there's a plate of brownies in front of me, you know, those little chocolate cakes, I, I'm going to eat them. It doesn't matter if I'm hungry or not. And and I know that I can't avoid that temptation because my ancestors couldn't either, right? They, they didn't want to. If they ever got that kind of calories, they wanted to shove it down. And so I just don't buy the damn things. Don't put them in the house and then I don't have to resist it. And so we're really good at planning our lives in ways to follow the, our understanding of the world and to avoid those temptations. We're terrible at resisting them. Hmm. So Bill, this has been amazing, man. Is there any last words you would like to end with or anything you want to promote? Uh, no, I, I don't think there's any anything I want to, oh, sorry, anything I'm, I'm keen on promoting or, or uh, suggesting, but I would just say that, look, all this stuff is great fun and we're learning more and more about it every day. And, and so there's lots of us working on these problems and there's lots of wonderful books on these topics and there's articles that are coming out in the paper all the time as we discover new genetic techniques and stuff. And so for me, it's a, just a super exciting area to keep tabs on. And an ending, an ending note you would like to end with? Uh, no, it's been wonderful chatting with you, though. <laughs> Great, man. I, I really enjoyed it. And it's super interesting how much we learn from ourselves now, knowing our evolutionary past. Yeah, absolutely agreed.